Minister of Counterfeiting, what is the impact on future public health and safety? This session will look into increased efforts and remaining challenges to stop the flow of fake goods posing a potential risk to public health and safety since the last Congress. Highlighting multiple risks to fake health products to public health and safety, expansion of the threat to a wide area of consumer products, recent efforts and joint projects and actions in the protection of health and safety, remaining challenges. Now I'd like to invite the moderator, Mr. Michael Ellis from Cosmetics Europe, the Personal Care Association, to introduce the speakers and moderate the panel. Thank you. So, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're reaching the final stages of a quite a long day, and I'm very conscious of the fact that this is the last session and we have uh, our cocktail reception to follow. So, for the next 60 minutes or so, we shall discuss the topic of um, the challenges and efforts to stop the flow of fakes, particularly focusing on those with an impact on health and safety, and we will touch on any progress, that highlight those progresses that have been made since the last Congress. During the session, we will touch on examples of such fakes. And with an audience like this, it, it's not necessary for me to point out the types of products that we're talking about, which would range from fake rice, fake tulips, fake olive oil, fake baby food, electrical components, chocolate, drink, automobile parts, everyday consumer goods, razors, pharmaceuticals, batteries, toothpastes, fake recycled injections taken from dustbins, repackaged and then sold back to pharmacies for use by consumers, fake shampoos, sun care products, and fake condoms. Take care. So we're going to look at the expansion of these threats. We will describe some of the joint efforts with the panel uh, between law enforcement, joint efforts and uh, private sector. And we will touch on the challenges ahead. On the panel today, we have a mix of both uh, public sector and private sector representatives, each of which has got the opportunity in the short time available to highlight some of their key points on the topics and our plan is to take questions and answers at the end of the session. I'll introduce them first to you. I have sitting next to me Luke A. Young, who I'm sure some of you will recognize as the Deputy Commissioner of Hong Kong China Customs and Excise Department. Sitting next to Luke, we have Aileen. Aileen Placon is the Assistant Director of the Interpol Pharmaceutical Subcrime Branch. Sitting next to Aileen, we have Iskari Fute, Iskari is from the Legal Counsel Department of the Tanzania Food and Drugs Authority. Then we have William Reed. William is a Senior Director within, e within uh, Eli Lilly Global Counterfeit Operations Unit and he's also a representative of the International Federation of the Pharmaceuticals Manufacturers Association. And finally at the end Last but not least, we have Mr. Chuck Chi. Uh, Chuck is a former Chinese police officer. Um, he has uh, 
some 15 years experience working in anti-counterfeiting in China and he's currently the Asia Regional Brand Protection Manager for Biosdorf um, and he's based in uh, Shanghai in China. So perhaps starting with you Luke I could ask you maybe to introduce or set to start us off maybe with describing some of the actions or focuses that you're doing within Hong Kong Customs. Thanks for the questions and uh, perhaps I will uh, provide the answers in, in the presentation in the uh, coming 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, thanks for the honor for inviting me uh, to uh, uh, say something on the enforcement of the Hong Kong customs. Um, I, I would like uh, to uh, start uh, by arguing that uh, um, IPR protection in Hong Kong is not an easy task because of the, the great, the huge volume of cargo being handled in Hong Kong being the uh, uh, regional uh, logistics hub. We are the uh, uh, third uh, uh, busiest container port in the world after uh, Shanghai and Singapore and we also handle on a daily basis the highest volume of uh, uh, international air cargo and we have a very large proportion of uh, transshipment cargoes and all these uh, huge volume cargoes make our, the work of customs uh, quite difficult. Uh, let me turn uh, um, on the um, situation of counterfeit medicine in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, we focus on, on the retail sales of counterfeit medicine. Uh, it is uh, not as prevalent as in other countries where the sales are, on, are found on the internet. And in the situation of Hong Kong, the problem is not serious. I would like uh, to provide um, an explanation on this. First of all, uh, the demand or, or, or on the consumer uh, for counterfeit uh, medicine should be, should be uh, very, very low, or, or if I say it's not zero. And the problem uh, margin is not uh, comparatively, it's not that high, and they have to push up the sales uh, volumes in, in order to get a, a profitable, um, a, um, a handsome profit. And of course, this must be made at the expense of uh, uh, being caught by Hong Kong Customs. Hong Kong Customs has, has adopted a, a very um, a stringent uh, a zero tolerance policy against uh, counter medicine, uh, given the damage it's, uh, it's uh, created uh, on the society. And once all these activities are detected, we immediately conduct swift and sometimes very rigorous enforcement uh, actions against, against uh, these uh, uh, dispensaries selling uh, fake drugs. Uh, let me elaborate further on the enforcement environment in the Hong Kong context. Hong Kong Customs is the uh, single enforcement agency, meaning that uh, uh, if other enforcement agencies are involved, they only provide a very minimal role. And being a single enforcement uh, agency, uh, we can have all the enforcement uh, strategies better coordinated, uh, for, uh, resources better focus and have the effectiveness of the strategy better assessed so that we can focus more on the areas where we should do more. And, and being a single enforcement agency, I'd like, would, I'd like to elaborate further is, is that in, in the context of Hong Kong, customs uh, perform both the role of customs and to a certain extent of the police role. Uh, as like uh, customs administrations in other parts of the world, we impose a control at all the borders to ensure that counter products are not uh, imported into territory and, and we use uh, uh, risk profiling techniques to enhance the effectiveness. And, and at the same time, Hong Kong Customs also conducts investigations against manufacturing, distribution and sales of uh, counterfeit uh, medicine. Uh, on the retail market and this is um, um, a function very unique to the Hong Kong Customs and we can ensure that uh, being a single enforcement agency we can ensure that the, uh, we are doing all we can 
uh, uh, to tackle the infringement uh, problem. That's, that's what we call it a, a comprehensive enforcement strategy. And the laws in Hong Kong are straight. Uh, uh, we have all sorts of laws to control the activities in, involved in the conflict medicine and the penalty is relatively high. We're talking about uh, five years, a maximum penalty of five years jail imprisonment and a, um, and a fine of US dollars 64,000. And if the illegal activities are proven to be managed and organized by syndicates, the sentence can be further enhanced and with the criminal proceeds uh, confiscated. Uh, as you can see from the slide, this is the enforcement approach uh, taken by Hong Kong Customs. We have uh, uh, targeted the, the problem from uh, a holistic angle. The interdiction at the border, just now I mentioned, is that uh, we try to enhance uh, the effectiveness by risk profiling. We also conduct market surveillance to assess the problems so that our uh, resource can, can be uh, focused on areas where we can effectively stop the supply. We also focus on a resource on uh, investigation so that uh, we can conduct uh, repeat rates on outlets so as to create the necessary uh, deterrence. We are very um, uh, serious about uh, uh, conducting investigations on very serious crimes like uh, organized trafficking and distribution of counterfeit medicines. And based on our experience, the resource used in these investigations is, is quite enormous. But uh, given the effectiveness of such a, 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 of, uh, operations, uh, we encourage using this, um, uh, this method, this strategy, because uh, we can uh, deal a very strong blow to these uh, criminals and get them out of the illegal market. And also we have been uh, working very closely with the Consumer Council in Hong Kong. They protect the consumer's interest and we cooperate in, in the core name and shame uh, strategy. We have the name of the dispensaries published in the monthly and uh, well-sold uh, publications. To, uh, once the names of the dispensaries are published, then the deterrence effect is, is very high. And, uh, after the publication, the, um, the, um, the allegations of, uh, of selling counterfeit problems has been reduced. And then we have the cooperation and partnership. Then I will elaborate further in the following slides. The challenges of, uh, of the counterfeit medicine over the uh, uh, worldwide, it's not in Hong Kong, of, of, of course in the world is, is, is on the sales on the internet and uh, using express courier service to deliver the count medicine uh, to to countries worldwide, and and I think one of the reasons uh, for the uh, effectiveness of, or for the uh, um, the problem uh, perpetrated is the varying priorities of the different enforcement agencies. Each have a different priorities and the focus. And, and that these criminals tend to uh, have the elements of the uh, evidence scattered in different jurisdictions, and that makes investigations difficult, that makes uh, prosecution difficult. And the criminals are getting smarter and smarter as they try to hide the identities uh, on the internet using uh, like a proxy or redirection technology. And I will uh, then share with you uh, two approaches has, that has been taken by customs in, in the in recent uh, year. And we have met with some success in, in two types of such uh, cooperation. The first one is uh, uh, cooperation with the um, United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. Because we, um, according to the intelligence and our, according to our survey, quite a lot of these um, counted products are delivered by express crews to the United States. And, and in the corporations, we are talking about sharing of the intelligence. Um, the information uh, collected by the ICE is on the seizure of the um, counted products 
at all the airports in the United States. And we, these information, they are passed to Hong Kong Customs within a week. And with these information, we analyze uh, the suspicious traders. And then we work closely together with the express, um, uh, uh, express cargo companies and also the Hong Kong's post office. And they are very cooperative in helping Hong Kong Customs to monitor the suspicious uh, accounts. And once the suspicious consignments are detected, they alert customs and then customs will take immediate actions. And then the approach is, is connected with a takedown or website approach. It is a disruption strategy that uh, this was mentioned in the previous uh, sessions. And in 2001, to the Japan National Police Agencies has identified 126 websites, all in Japanese, and they approached the Hong Kong Customs uh, for assistance. And in our investigation, we find that all these websites are um, uh, hosted in Hong Kong by service providers. But, we, uh, but our investigations also show that these web owners are not uh, um, residents in Hong Kong. Uh, so, if you are talking about successful prosecution or collection of evidence and asking for support from all these jurisdictions, then it will be a very uh, difficult uh, uh, task. Uh, so, we choose a, a much easier way and try to convince the uh, web hosting companies to take down websites, offering the evidence provided by the uh, Japan police agencies, and we are uh, very successful in taking down these 126 websites within a very short notice. And the fact is that we stop the, the flow of counterfeit goods uh, to consumers and reducing the damage. Uh, uh, perhaps I, I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It's very interesting to hear how hung, uh, certainly Hong Kong Customs are able to have a special focus being the single point of enforcement contact, which of course gives you many benefits in terms of your flexibility and very good to see. Very interested also, I love this idea of this public name and shaming concept. I can imagine that brings a, a lot of damage to those people who are trading. And uh, interested also carrying on from the previous presentation how you identified the Obviously, the continuing threats uh, of the internet and, of course, small parcels and express cargo. So maybe moving on to uh, Aileen. Aileen, perhaps you could um, describe or expand a little bit upon um, the Interpol program and, uh, towards this problem. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to, to present the, uh, the Interpol perspective and to um, update you on uh, what we see since uh, the last Global Congress. We see good things and we see things that need to be improved as a challenge, of course, in the area of pharmaceutical crime. Uh, we call it pharmaceutical crime now because uh, we still uh, learn on a day by day uh, in the contact of the criminals to see how they are uh, delivering their activities into this area. And what we see is that they are still making high profits and they're still not enough going into jail in terms of prosecutions but also in terms of sentences. We see people that are highly sophisticated and we are trying to uh, learn a bit more about their behavior now. So we, are, uh, we have undertaken an, a study on uh, organized crime and pharma crime to try and look into more details on what they are doing. Sophisticated, that's for sure, um, but also some little bunch of people that are still working on opportunities to make money, which is only the, uh, the driver for them, that um, are still uh, ongoing. We see that um, they are multiplicating their activities. So nonetheless that they are um, doing pharmaceutical crime but other types of related activities. And the last operation Pangea showed that uh, they are nonetheless using botnets for internet in order to spread out their capacity of, um, of uh, having more people buying illicit pharma online. But they are also linked with other types of crimes, such as, of course, money laundering, but we also saw some pedopornography, and uh, we also saw some illicit gambling online. So
So we are seeing that they are multiplicating any kind of activities. Also, in terms of uh, pharmaceutical crime per se, we, we had to be confronted to some cases of massive diversion of medicines. So they are genuine ones, but they are not going where they are supposed to go. So massive frauds behind and, of course, corruption that is led to this kind of behavior. So we are adapting along the line with what they are doing. And so we are definitely developing a program, developing a partnership, and trying to consolidate what we believe is a success, which is the disciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. We are working with a number of stakeholders from the international organization range, but also member countries, agencies, uh, from the customs, the police, of course, but the regulatory authorities. We are partnering uh, strongly with the private sector. And all in all, we are trying to consolidate this uh, partnership in order to make it efficient. And we saw with the uh, last operation Pangea, the number five, that uh, member countries, so agencies, and also private sector interacting together are getting at a level, a better level of maturity in addressing this crime, in developing investigations, but also raising awareness in their own country, adapting to their own citizens in order to alert them about this uh, pharmaceutical crime problem and counterfeiting in particular. We insist in our program in the necessity of getting the balance between public health and safety. Uh, we are conscious of the fact that we need to investigate and boost investigations. This is why we are here in Interpol in, uh, in order to assist, but we also are here to, uh, to make sure that the safety of the citizen is ensured. So we are sometimes challenged in terms of uh, investigation priorities, but also public health priorities, which is constantly something we are trying to, to keep in mind. Uh, nevertheless, the exchange of information that were generated and this multidisciplinary um, approach has led a number of information of exchange in terms of uh, getting more knowledge of these criminal networks. And, and right now we've got over 132 international transnational cases that are being dealt with over 40 countries and law enforcement around the globe. So maturity again is there and it's getting better and better. Last year, uh, or last Global Congress, I had one green notice to report to the public and to you in the audience. And today we've got 33 red notices, so international arrest warrants, that has been issued by our Interpol uh, organization towards criminals that are uh, behaving and uh, dealing with pharmaceutical crime. So that is a mark uh, of uh, better uh, cooperation between uh, the agencies. Uh, the Operation Pangea has led also to one interesting development, which is uh, creation of new groups to really make a disruption of the organized crime network operating online. And we wouldn't have been able to have this group now without the past Operation Pangea. And we really now are in a position to say that we are starting together with our partners, of course, but we are starting together to disrupt the organized crime online trafficking fake medicines. And that is thanks to a partnership between the member countries, all the agencies and the private sector, especially the payment providers, but also the service providers, the uh, private sector pharmaceuticals and the one uh, that are specialized on uh, online and internet services. So we identified a number of challenges and at the same time we are getting over these, um, these challenges by working better together. Um, we see since the last Global Congress that there are more partners interested in this fight and there are more institutions working onto it, which is a good news uh, because there's enough work for everyone. Um, we need to be careful and constantly try and find a tuned coordination between all the actions, including at the international level, and we are ver being very careful to try and continuing this coordination. 
And uh, we also welcomed uh, this new initiative with the private sector uh, industry that have um, decided to support our organization. So 29 of these pharmaceutical industry um, have decided to support us, which is a, a good milestone into developing the program and uh, moving forward in, uh, in fantastic uh, public-private uh, partnership conditions. Now, um, it's never enough, right? And uh, we identify more and more the needs of uh, knowledge for the law enforcement communities and the others. Um, we are trying to develop some new initiatives such as the train the trainers, e-learning modules, but also we start interacting in universities in order to, uh, to put this little uh, seed into the brain of the new uh, investigators and also pharmacists and uh, health professionals so that they can keep the fake medicines and the pharmaceutical crime problems in mind for the future. Uh, but not enough, uh, we feel uh, great frustrations in terms of prosecutions. Um, we find that lots of investigations are not uh, going through because of lack of legislation still and also because of uh, lack of uh, great dialogue with the judiciaries. This is something that we need to address more and it's our responsibility as well. And we see that um, the criminals are moving fast and they are also richer and richer, which uh, doesn't make our life easy. So um, we recognize that uh, even though this morning we heard that uh, the IPR infringement is a human right, uh, so far the fight against pharmaceutical crime is not there yet, but we are on the right way. That's why I wanted to, to outline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aileen. It's um, particularly interesting to know your comments on how, from an enforcement perspective, you actually get better knowledge following the Pangaea operation. So you're learning more from each operation. You're carrying your experiences to the next operation, which is great. Better police awareness, better investigative skills from, from the enforcement perspective, more intelligence leading to more cases. All positive, positive, positive. But the, the letdown as you said at the end is unfortunately you mentioned or you called it the judicial letdown and I think a lot of brand holders would, would, would accept that and the sort of low deterrent sentences that we still see for IP crimes which, uh, which still maybe needs to be worked upon. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, Mr. Fute. Um, Mr. Futi, as I mentioned in the introduction, is uh, from the Legal Counsel Department of the Tanzania Food and Drugs Authority. Um, maybe, um, Mr. Fute, you could describe to uh, the audience some of the um, uh, actions and uh, progresses that you're making in Tanzania within your unit. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming from the public sector, so mostly I will talk about the involvement of the public in, in terms of fighting counterfeit. You, as you may understand that actually a IP or protection of intellectual property has been for years as a private right. But now in terms of, uh, of public aspect point of view, this is now a public right. So governments, most of the governments are moving towards making human rights uh, provisions, constitution provisions to make sure that the protection of public is an obligation of the government. So this the private and government must uh, complement to each other. Why I'm saying so? Because uh, we realize that uh, public health aspect is a question of life and death. So, whether you talk about uh, medicine, you talk about food product, the, the, ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate effect risk is actually death, and sometimes there is resistance if we are talking about medicine. Uh, so, it is very, very important that the, the, the public is involved 
in terms of police legislation and enforcement. So we, we, we focusing on that, we, we have been participating in a number of uh, joint effort with the other international and national uh, uh, organization to fight against, against the counterfeit. Well, from a number of studies have been conducted to see actually the, the extent of the problem, especially with sub-Saharan. There are a number of studies, but the, I, I think for, from the public point of view, on my view, what matters to fight against the uh, counterfeit is not the question of the size of the problem, because one single death has the same value as 1,000 deaths. So the involvement of the public to fight against counterfeit is very, very important, regardless of how many deaths or, or to what extent is the risk created. That is why you can see now a number of legislations are being developed a number of policies are being developed, but the issue that I can see, it appears like there is some gap of collaboration from national to international level. And this gap, I think we have to work on it because a number of presentation and the evidence shows that in most of the counterfeit products, they are going, the global now is a single market. They are borderless. We have electronic transaction where products are moving from one market to another, and therefore private sector and, the, and, the, and public sector must focus on the same market. And therefore, we need to have a joint effort to make sure that we fight against the counterfeit, regardless of national identity, regional identity, or global identity. And I'm happy that this conference today is my first time. I think it marks the global approach in terms of fighting against the counterfeit. We, last year, as the Tanzania participated in, in Pangea 5, as, as, as introduced by Aline, it was very, very interesting to us because it was our first time to see surveillance being done through internet or website. So my question, as my background is actually is illegal, so I was trying to see how many legislation, policies, and enforcement uh, framework in various governments address electronic transaction. It appears most especially in sub-Saharan countries, the legislation still address the issues of paper-based transaction. So that is a barrier for enforcement. I think we have to move to make sure that our legislations address electronic problem. My legislation as well in my country does not address a electronic transaction, does not address electronic transaction. I think there is a need for, for, for legislation also to address electronic transaction. And then I was trying to see what can we do from the public point of view in order to make sure that at least we strengthen the collaboration, we also strength, strengthen the joint effort that is being done. Because it appears with one nation, one group, one region, we can't be able to capture the dynamics of counterfeits. So we need to, to address, like we, had, we need to, to build capacity to capture new technology, and dynam dynamics, and also have uh, some soft sophisticated equipment to test. 
And also you can see that the punishment and the enforcement sometimes is weak and sometimes is linked even to, 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 to corruption. So it is my view that when I went to England for Pangea 5, I could witness how they confiscate proceeds of crime. I, to me, that is very, very important because especially for corrupt uh, uh, society, if you don't confiscate the money, that means it is the same money which is going to rescue that, that, the, 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 the criminal. So, but when you, you, you confiscate the money, you paralyze the power of the criminal to take money and corrupt so that he can be successful. So I think these are the issues for which, when we go back to our legislation, we have to think about it. And that needs a very strong collaboration between, because I know some of the governments will be hesitant to make strong enforcement, but I think a private sector also, you can push some of the government because the effort that is taken from the public point of view actually complements to the protection of IP. Thank you. Ms. Kari, I thank you very much for your, uh, your, your comments and um, actually you reflected on some of the opening remarks this, this morning where it was pointed out that you know, there's a human rights obligation for protection uh, by society from governments, from law enforcement against this, this uh, endemic problem that we face and you've, you've, you've um, certainly highlighted and touched on that again. And also, of course, interesting now you, you highlight the need for involvement of public and consumers. And I know over the years there have been many research programs on how we can better interact with consumers in raising awareness. And then for your challenges, you've, you've brought, you've brought to, to the fore two clear points, the need for global coordination, which is ever-present. And for your part of the world, you've recognised the need for more modern legislation to address um, online activities and I guess in time we can only hope that will come. But your final, your final, um, your final points of interest for me was how you've touched on the proceeds of crime legislation and asset recovery and you're quite right that in certain parts of the world that legislation exists. You mentioned the UK where, where um, the asset recovery team have been active over the years. And it certainly is a powerful tool, I accept, if we can find the links between criminality and the assets by the criminals, a very powerful tool for us to, or, or for, for law enforcement or, or governments to exploit. And uh, I thank you for bringing that, bringing that to uh, the attention of the floor. Thank you. So moving on um, to uh, William. As I said, William is working for, uh, within the Eli Lilly Global Anti-Cancer Feet Unit, uh, anti and he's here as a representative of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. So, William, the floor is yours. I appreciate that very much, and I'm very conscious that uh, we are the two individuals between the, this group and the reception, so I will, I will be brief and attempt not to plow new ground that has been uh, talked about in great detail today, and I want to thank the, the host for the opportunity to speak. Uh, just a, a brief background, IFPMA is a research-based uh, pharmaceutical industry association that includes biotech and the vaccine sectors as well as national associations in uh, Europe, Japan and uh, the United States. Our uh, policy framework is guided by ten principles. I'll briefly mention uh, three or four that Medicine counterfeiting is first and foremost a crime against patients. I uh, very much appreciate the, the previous speaker's message that uh, we can share all sorts of different numbers and uh, I will do so as well in terms of the global impact. But this is about uh, patient safety and is the foundation upon uh, which our work is based. Uh, counterfeit medicines threaten the full spectrum of legitimate medicines. It isn't uh, narrow with any therapeutic area but touches uh, a number of different um, sectors. 
patents have nothing to do, or patents, I'm sorry, patents have nothing to do with counterfeiting, and counterfeiting has nothing to do with patents, and global cooperation and collaboration is very much needed. Uh, I'll touch on uh, three things, just anti-counterfeiting or counterfeiting in context, uh, the challenges that, that we face as an industry, and a few uh, case examples, and then opportunities uh, that I, I will summarize at the end. Uh, just in context, the World Economic Forum estimates that uh, counterfeit pharmaceuticals represent a $200 billion global industry that is a threat uh, to patient health and to economic growth uh, in all geographies. Uh, this can result in increased drug resistance, illness, and deaths. And false drug trade targets all therapeutic areas, including life-saving cancer medicines and generics. The problem is global in scope. Anecdotal incident reports and published research suggest a much bigger problem as we have uh, met in previous years as a Congress. The problem seems to be growing and I think that is supported, as I said, by incident reports and published research. Uh, we as a company are seeing oncology medicines uh, counterfeited in uh, Latin America, in China, where used vials of our products are being uh, filled or purchased outside of clinics and then being refilled uh, with all sorts of things that are not cancer medications and reinserted into the supply chain. On a positive front, uh, here uh, in Turkey we've seen uh, recent seizures and uh, efforts to take down websites, uh, but again uh, those incidents, uh, while um, positive in terms of uh, the efforts between the pharmaceutical industry, the Ministry of Health, um, suggest that there is a, a problem. And also, uh, the advent and expansion of the Internet, uh, there is an explosion of Canadian pharmacy websites that uh, are prevalent in the domestic U.S. and again, uh, touch on uh, the need for additional patient awareness uh, that uh, is a foundation of our efforts. Uh, it's a multi-jurisdictional problem, uh, as we've talked about through the course of the day, uh, when you're faced with uh, websites that are housed uh, all over uh, the globe, call centers in Panama that may be shipping product through Hong Kong, um, sometimes stamped with Royal Mail, and then end up uh, in a consumer's uh, post, uh, post box, that is a multi-jurisdictional problem that requires a coordinated global effort. Um, I, you know, I will say in terms of opportunities, uh, my glass uh, tends to be half full, although that one may not be. Uh, but you know, we have to look at this uh, in a positive front, and I think the collaboration, the networking that we're able to achieve in, in programs like this is very important because of the best practices and learnings that, uh, that, we, can, uh, that we can all take away. Uh, in terms of the opportunities, as we look at the objectives of securing the legitimate supply chain, deterring major counterfeiters, and partnering with government and non-government organizations, a harmonized international standard for product serialization is one uh, goal that we have in terms of uh, an international standard. We heard about that in earlier presentations today, but the industry and, and Lilly itself is investing $100 million in terms of capital expenditure and investment in order to meet regulatory standards in different markets uh, throughout the world and having an international harmonized standard for product serialization would be one way to better secure the legitimate supply chain. In terms of deterring counterfeiters, uh, efforts at uh, law enforcement training, uh, capacity building, and additional resources for law enforcement are, are efforts uh, that we can continue to sustain and build upon. The internet monitoring enforcement that we've talked about, that we as an individual company and as an uh, industry association in terms of principles uh, for the internet are things that we will continue to work on. And then partnering with government and non-government organizations around patient awareness raising as well as strengthening laws and, and uh, toughening criminal penalties. Uh, as we've uh, talked about, the partnership with Interpol is a very uh, positive step for the industry. Uh, we as an individual uh, company are working with the WCO on the IPM database and are seeing positive results. And then uh, another coalition called the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies, or ASOP, uh, which had uh, originated in the U.S., is now expanding into 
uh, Europe and potentially also in J into Japan. And uh, again, that is an effort at uh, both uh, patient awareness raising around uh, the threats of counterfeits over the Internet and looking at specific legislation um, in each of those different markets. Finally, there are multilateral fora, whether it be uh, the G8 or APEC, where we continue to partner with government to achieve or advance some of the principles, whether that be around uh, product serialization or the Internet, and we will continue to pursue efforts uh, with both government and non-government organizations at those uh, fora, uh, particularly this year, uh, early in the summer in the UK, and then with APEC in the Asian markets through the course of the year. Again, um, securing the legitimate supply chain, deterring major counterfeiters, and partnering with government and non-government organizations. Each of those as individual companies and as uh, respective trade associations in the U.S., Europe, Japan, and elsewhere, and then through the IFPMA, uh, are where we have uh, guiding principles, objectives, and tactics aimed at uh, fighting this threat of counterfeits, which in my experience, I would suggest the incidents, maybe some of it anecdotal, are growing. But with the work uh, of individuals in, in this room and across the globe, uh, we can continue to fight and achieve success. Um, it just may take uh, the next three to five years, but we'll stay with it. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you gave to, to, to countless examples of uh, joint cooperation, joint international cooperation, um, association cooperation, which I think, of course, is, is tremendously positive. You touched on, again, the highlights of um, the threats posed by the Internet, which is a common theme that's occurred certainly after the, since the tea break. And I think you, you brought some attention to the need for harmonised standards of recognition, which is a theme that will be carried on through the through the uh, conference. You mentioned fake cancer medicines in your, in your short speech and that, that brought me towards thinking of, about the impacts of fake HIV medicines and things, those types of... And Tanzania, you, you spoke about one death, I agree with you, one death is one death too many. One death or a thousand deaths. But, I just reflect, I had the misfortune or, or the fortune to meet a lady who suffered from uh, the disease of river blindness, disease in um, West Africa. And there's um, a very simple medication that can protect you from river blindness. It's, a, it's, it's quite a simple procedure. And this woman who's already ill, she's already suffering from the disease, she's exposed to counterfeit, she buys the fake medication, loses her sight never ever to come back, blind forever, simply because of the misfortune, the position that she's found herself in, having to buy fakes, lost her sight because of the criminal activities by people uh, in her society or in her community. And um, without bringing it to particular individual cases, that was something left a tremendous mark on me personally, and it's uh, obviously what drives us, uh, drives us forward. So moving on to the last speaker, Chuck. Uh, Chuck Chi, as I, as I mentioned in my introduction, is um, representing the fast mover consumer goods industry. Chuck is a former Chinese police officer. Maybe, Chuck, you could give us a perspective of some of the efforts, uh, enforcement efforts in China or, or some of the threats that, you're, that you've seen uh, in your experience in uh, working in China. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yes. A lot of progress has been made since the last Congress. So I'm going to show you a small video about an event happened in China five weeks after that last Congress. It happened in Urumqi, a city uh, miles away from Beijing, but very has a uh, long borders with eight uh, countries such as Russia and the CIS countries. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, such uh, activity is uh, very typical in China. Uh, I have to say the way of the destruction is uh, not environmental uh, friendly, but it's uh, helpful to uh, raise the IPR awareness to educate the public so such a kind of activity uh, repeated uh, very uh, often in recent years uh, in China. As a brand protection manager uh, based in China, we experienced and witnessed China's most aggressive uh, enforcement uh, actions in recent two years. From October uh, 2010 to June, uh, 2011, yeah, China launched a nationwide special campaign against uh, IPR infringement and uh, counterfeiting. Whereas law enforcement authorities uh, took promote actions against IPR infringement, production and the sales of counterfeit product, big products and shutting uh, products, which result a huge number of various kinds of cases greatly deterred uh, infringers and educated the public. Police and customs are the key players in the campaign. Uh, Chinese uh, economic police, we call it ECID, initiate and carry out uh, operations swore a national-wide uh, special operation against IPR crime, sorrow out of the country, uh, in year uh, 2010 and 2011, which made a uh, significant achievement. In the operation, yeah, police introduced a new investigation strategy targeted the entire criminal network rather than the individual target. Local police are required to develop intelligence carry out in deep investigation, dig out a criminal network whenever is possible. Enforcement actions are designed and undertaken in a so-called uh, cluster battle way, reading old identified link the target uh, currently to maximize the effectiveness of the enforcement. Uh, ECID also divides China into a three uh, special uh, operational zone in order to coordinate the enforcement. And the new strategy and enforcement model uh, turned out to be a success. One battle normally achieves a dozen of criminal cases, a dozen to hundred arrests and uh, with a lot of counterfeit products seized and uh, some uh, very big uh, counterfeiting groups has been cracked down uh, during the operation. Some of them, uh, for example, in our personal care industry, some target in, Guang in Guangdong province uh, used to be an untouchable source of counterfeit products has been cracked down during the operation. And this, uh, a special operation uh, swore lasted for uh, 15 months and uh, ended uh, at the end of year 2011. Uh, but instead of taking a break, the ECID carried on their efforts. They took uh, a special operation in, last, in uh, Sarat last year and will carry on uh, in this year. Uh, Coming into this year, the uh, MPS ECID uh, contact brand owners. They're going to uh, establish a nation, national uh, forensic uh, database of IPR uh, crime. And uh, for the, the local uh, police also uh, take actions. For example, in Shanghai, the Shanghai ECID set up a 100% uh, IPR task force, 100% focus on uh, IPR cases, and uh, they approach uh, QVPC, and we just assigned, re renewed uh, MOU uh, in last month. 
and uh, for uh, some progress also made at the provincial level for uh, example in uh, Zhejiang, the provincial ECID uh, set up a special uh, division to working on the internet uh, cases. In uh, uh, Zhejiang, Hangzhou, we all know the top is the city that uh, the Taobao.com located. So that, for that reason, uh, the uh, police uh, set up that uh, special uh, task force. Also, it happened in Yiwu city. It was a very small con a small city in Zhejiang province where uh, it's famous it's famous for wholesale market where people uh, coming from all over the world to go to uh, that city for uh, purchase of various kinds of, uh, of various kinds of goods yeah, in the past because it's uh, just a small city so the local police uh, did not have the jurisdiction to investigate into foreigner the case get the foreigners invo involved in the IPR crime. But uh, in last uh, September, the situation changed. The local police get the jurisdiction which enable the local uh, ECID, the police, to investigate into such kinds of cases. Uh, Chinese Customs is another uh, pedal of IPR protection. Chinese Customs is one of a few customs authorities on the earth that stop the export of counterfeiting goods. And uh, uh, made, uh, by doing so, Chinese Customs made itself a very important force of international joint efforts combating IP uh, infringement. Here's just some number of the uh, Chinese customs cases. Yeah. Yeah, look at the, the, code, uh, the code number. Normally, people won't recognize the efforts made by enforcement authorities. But if we, uh, comparing with the situation uh, eight, uh, 18 years ago, when China first introduced its uh, customs uh, IPR protection, yeah, we will see a significant progress has been made in this, uh, in this uh, precise, in many terms, for example, the monthside uh, change, the transparency of legislation and the enforcement and the capacity building and the uh, uh, deliverables. Uh, continually for six years, uh, Chinese Customs, the GACC, was recognized as the most effective uh, Chinese enforcement authority by QBPC members in our annual uh, survey. Uh, in the fight uh, against the counterfeiting, the cooperation uh, between uh, enforcement authorities and the brand owner also greatly uh, strengthened in China. I'm going to show some, some picture of various kinds of activities uh, QBPC member uh, conducted with enforcement authorities, with the Chinese police, with the Chinese customs, on various kinds of topics uh, regarding uh, the uh, IPR uh, enforcement. Also, uh, the challenge remains. Uh, on one hand, the counterfeit, the counterfeit learn very quickly from enforcement and uh, always take various account countermeasures uh, to ensure their illegal interests and uh, avoid being uh, captured. And uh, on the other hand, with the economic downturn, uh, IP protection uh, become flexible uh, in some places uh, during some, a certain period of time where uh, authority enforce the law uh, selectively. Uh, for example, uh, people uh, intend to focus on traditional uh, crime rather than IPR crime, uh, used to focus on the individual target rather than the entire criminal uh, group, uh, rather than the transnational uh, network of counterfeiting. Uh, they have no problem yet to take actions against their own citizens, but they are not willing to take actions uh, against the foreigners who engage 
uh, IPR crime uh, in their country. To fight back counterfeiting uh, the transnational uh, crime, yeah, we need more international cooperation uh, in enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck, for, for bringing to our attention some of the efforts of the, the Chinese um, law enforcement authorities. I would mirror your comments regarding China Customs, who have been a, a great um, asset for many private sector members, some of you obviously in the room, and also the efforts of the China police. How many countries could, just take you some of your statistics, how many countries could give a key performance indicator as follows, 30,000 arrests in one year, 13,000 production sites closed in one year, Operation Sword, 44,000 complaints leading to 50,000 arrests, leading to 32,000 production sites being closed. Quite phenomenal efforts by, by the authorities um, in China. And also you, you brought to the fore some of the positives, the uh, national forensic database that's been established by the Chinese police, very interesting um, and we shall see how that develops. The dedicated IPR unit in Shanghai um, and the special division for the task force for internet investigations which has been developed. There's lots of positives um, happening. So I'm very conscious of the time. We're almost dead on by my clock. Um, I would like to open it to the floor. Um, I hope you will give me some indulgence, maybe two or three questions um, from the audience. Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question to Mr. Luke. Oh, we know uh, uh, IP inf infringement, especially for the medicine, uh, by after by by uh, day by day is in Christ. Uh, we know uh, medicine is uh, dangerous because relation to the law. Uh, life and the hurt of a person. My question, how custom strategy uh, to anticipate, anticipate uh, about it? Thank you. Uh, can, you can you repeat again the last sentence in those your questions? Anticipate. To anticipate. Anticipate about oh, okay. it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, we customs uh, have to work under allegations, in response to allegations from the public sector, from the public, and, and, and also by our surveillance, market surveillance. As I just uh, present, uh, make a presentation just now, uh, a part of a strategy uh, is on uh, market surveillance. In the past, we received a relatively little, uh, a few allegations on uh, counterfeit products. As I said, in Hong Kong, the situation is not that, uh, it's not such a problem as on the sales and the retail sales, uh, because uh, there's a quite a lot of um, um, uh, dispensaries in Hong Kong, um, and the people uh, doesn't have to buy the medicines on the internet, and this is the situation of Hong Kong, and. According to our estimations, the problem is not high uh, because we receive quite a few allegations uh, uh, from the industries or from the public about uh, counterfeit medicines, but we are not uh, complacent about that and we conduct a market survey together with uh, the Health Department of Hong Kong and they have inspectors uh, performing inspections on the, uh, on the dispensaries selling products and then we ask them to, as they collect samples then uh, we ask them to provide samples on designated uh, products where we believe uh, to be, uh, have a high risk of, of, of being uh, uh, faked. And perhaps I can give you a, a, a figures on, on a two reason exercise exercises on, on the uh, sampling. In the two exercises, we have sampled in 820 dispensaries, 
but out of the 826 uh, dispensary, only find five samples that are faked. And this has proven uh, that the problem is not serious in Hong Kong. Mm. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you. I'm Petra Hercule from DSM. I'm not, uh, we are not directly into the pharmaceutical business, but we are involved in selling products like cut-resistant gloves that contain our brands, whereas you can also see that there is a risk involved for end consumers if they have, for example, a glove that contains fake material and that will cut their hands. Um, my question is more related to Mr. Reed and Mr. Xi. Um, we are just starting branding within our company. Um, what I explained to my internal customers is that you can see it in first instance almost as a compliment that people start creating or making counterfeit products because then it shows that your brand is interesting. But how do you explain internally the investments that need to be made and in addition to that if you see that you can take actions but the penalties are so low that people can start all over again because it's just easy. Um, so it's probably two different questions, but how do you work with these kind of things? I'll take the first, the first shot at this, and just so you understand a little bit of my background, I've, I've worked in corporate affairs, which is government affairs, public policy, for 15 or 20 years, and I will tell you just you need to first understand that speaking to a sales and uh, other functions, it is very difficult to speak in terms of return on investment or numbers when you're dealing with counterfeit because they don't file a business plan that you can then pick up and, and speak. But you very much need to talk in a cross-functional effort that involves manufacturing, legal, security, public policy, and corporate affairs. I, you know, it's talking about the supply chain from an enterprise-wide standpoint and then the external engagement necessary to, to talk about patient awareness and um, you know, the, the efforts in partnering with government and non-government organizations to affect public policy because um, the, the, the effort requires the security investigations and the legal uh, aspect of it, but I look at it very much from a public policy standpoint and that's a multi-year you know, effort in working with regulators and the public health uh, sectors. So I, I hope I answered your question in some respect because I think there's getting past the hurdle of trying to find that one way to explain something that is a much longer discussion and story uh, depending upon the audience. Maybe I can, I can share a little bit with what you, uh, the company I work for, we have many sub-brands and I, I, unfortunately we discovered fakes of a particular sub-brand we had never had counterfeits before and I had the undaunting task to go upstairs to the CEO walking along the long corridor knock on the door to see the CEO and said I'm awfully sorry sir I've got some bad news we found fakes of sub-brand X and his reply was great we've been recognized we've made it because this concept in his mind that now that we've been counterfeited that yes you've reached the target which is of course completely wrong from my perspective it's about brand equity it's about brand value so you as a company you must put in as much as you think you need to to protect your what you perceive as your brand equity and find that balance and that's the challenge for all companies small medium or large how much do you invest how much do you want to get back and it's uh, there's plenty of people in the room to advise you sure one final question. Sorry, yes, miss. Thank you very much. Yasim Nakgurek from Turkish Ministry of Health. I'd like to draw attention to all participants at the tail. Um, in the pharmaceutical area, uh, IP issues uh, doesn't directly um, um, related with uh, protection of public health. Uh, as you know, uh, IP rights uh, in pharmaceutical areas are still controversial all over the world. And it doesn't mean if you infringe an IP right, you, um, uh, you um, act against the public health. Uh, 
Uh, that's why I think all um, all speakers and uh, all um, participants has to take into account uh, in context of not to uh, mislead the uh, public. Uh, IP protection doesn't mean to, means always protection of public health in case of pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, I, I completely agree as Interpol with, with what you are saying and uh, the, the whole base of a program based on pharmaceutical crime is really to acknowledge that IPR is one way of fighting counterfeiting but necessarily not into pharmaceutical because we see lots of infringement, lots of offenses on pharmaceutical that IPR cannot do anything against and especially when you see, when you see fake generics or illicit diversion there's no IPR that can ever um, do anything in terms of investigation or sentences. So completely um, agree with you that we shouldn't uh, make uh, too much confusion. Do you want to say something? Do you want to say something? Thank you. Thank you. Just to add from, in fact, you, you are right. And, and you will see most of the legislations for pharmaceuticals are broader than IP itself. The, 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 the rationale is, as I was saying, is about life and death. So what we are to understand is like the legislation and the, and from the public, from pharmaceuticals, actually complement to the IP effort for protection. So uh, in protection of IP is a smaller unit. But in a bigger area, the, 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 the pharmaceutical legislation has expanded beyond the, the IP. The reason is that we know the risk of, of, of counterfeit medicine. So you, I think most of you are following up the effort that has been done from the WHO point of view to, 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 to combat counterfeit. So, I think the two have to be complemented. Thank you. So I think we'll, I thank you very much for your patience. I think we will bring the session to a close now. If you'd like to please join me in thanking our panel for their comments. Thank you.